The Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade has sent Washington into overdrive as observers consider the political and cultural ramifications. That brings us to the analysis of Capehart and Gerson. That is Jonathan Capehart, associate editor for The Washington Post, and his colleague at The Post, opinion columnist Michael Gerson. David Brooks is away. And we welcome both of you to the News Hour on this Friday night. And Jonathan, I'm going to start with you with the story that is uh, all over the news today, and that is the Supreme Court. What do you? What is your reaction? Well, I think I worked out my um, not not rage, but my alarm. Alarm is is the right word when the leak of Justice Alito's draft opinion overturning Roe v.ersus Wade was leaked last month, and in reading it. I saw, you know, Roe is being overturned, but a bunch of other rights to privacy would be um, would be weakened if Roe were overturned. Um, with the decision out today, it, it hews closely to that draft opinion, and you know, I'm sitting here still trying to process what it means to live in a post-Roe world. Because we've got states that had trigger laws that the moment um, Roe was overturned, abortion was made illegal. And I, my heart goes out to um, women who now have, who live in states where their right to choose their own reproductive health care is no longer their, their decision. And I feel so, and, and my heart goes out to those families because this is, it's not only a personal decision for the woman, for the person who's pregnant, it's a decision that impacts an entire family. There are men out there who are going to be dealing with this as well. So in the, in the hours that we've been trying to digest all this, I'm still trying to get my, my head around what this means, but this much I know, it's not good. Michael, your thoughts? Well, I had a similar reaction in one way. I mean, I come from a pro-life background. Um, but this, I found my views very mixed today. Um, we are a nation with an escalating culture war. And placing this issue right now in the center of our national debate in states across the country is going to be deeply divisive. Um, it's a terrible time. <laughs> Uh, to, you know, to talk about this set of issues. I also thought that there were a couple of good points made in criticism in the decision itself. Um, one of them is by Roberts, the chief justice of the Supreme Court, that Criticizing said... Criticizing the, the main opinion. The, the main opinion. He concurred, but criticized. It's a very prickly opinion, essentially saying, I would have done it differently. This, you did not just need to overturn Roe completely in order to answer this Miss, Mississippi case. Um, he actually, um, you know, he said that this, this ruling, uh, you know, was a ruling all the way down to the studs. Um, and that was, uh, you know, to see that kind of dissent within the, the majority was kind of interesting. And then there was the, the, the I thought the dissent made the decision or, or made the point very well. Um, but Alito says in the decision that this does not affect other cases uh, right. that have to do with sexual privacy. Right. But he doesn't make a pretty, particularly good argument about why his reasoning would not, okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, and there, there could be good reasons. Maybe John Roberts could write them, okay? But the, the reality is that that was left a little bit blank. Um, and and it, I, I think it's going to cause some consternation. Um, what do you think this says, Jonathan, about the court, what we're, what we're looking at here? I, I mean, I think the, the credibility of the court is um, now more on the line than ever. I hesitate to say that the legitimacy of the court is, is in question or at risk, because that's just, that's a step too far. But when you read this decision and you read the concurring opinions, the legitimacy of the court is going, I think, will be eroded. And to, to, to Michael's point about uh, Alito saying, don't worry, don't worry, this only applies to abortion. He made that same argument uh, in that draft opinion, and that is what raised my alarm. And just to put it, 
just to sort of be an exclamation point on Alito's don't worry, don't worry, you have um, the senior most justice, Justice Clarence Thomas, putting in writing, in future cases, we should reconsider all of this court's substantive due process precedents, including Griswold, Lawrence, and Obergefell. Obergefell, mar uh, the um, right to same-sex marriage. Lawrence, that guaranteed a right to privacy to, to same-sex inti intimate contact. Griswold, um, uh, right of married couples um, to have access to contraception. contraception. Yeah. These are, these, right. all of these decisions, they're grounded, Roe is their foundation. And so now, as, as a, you know, an out gay married man, I'm now faced, like officially with the prospect of my marriage being rendered illegal. Do you think this, this decision tells us something new about this court? Well, it certainly, uh, given the frustration of the Chief Justice, it tells us this is not the Roberts court, okay? Mm -hmm. This is someone else's court. <laughs> it's the leadership is being, uh, you know, uh, shown by the five justices themselves, uh, that not, not including um, uh, Roberts. And, um, you know, that's, a, that's an awkward position for, for him to be in. But even he, I mean, this is a 6-3 decision, um, has accepted the basic point here, which is the point of the conservative um, rev uh, legal revolution over the last several decades, which is if the Constitution doesn't say it, okay, yeah. um, then... Um, we cannot uh, create rights, okay? And there was an additional element here that I want to say, which is the point that, one point that Alito makes is that there are actually two groups with visions of human rights at stake here, okay? Not just one, okay? Um, and one of those groups, the pro-life people in America, were told by Roe v. Wade, you can never win, yeah. okay? They were essentially disenfranchised, at least in their own minds. Um, and that was also a source of division in our country for 50 years. Um, so, I, you know, it's, it's a perilous decision whichever way you go, but I think that there are some arguments to be made in favor of it. Perilous, Jonathan. Um, and do you see it having an, a, a political effect in this already fraught election year? Oh, absolutely. Um, at a time when Democrats are facing headwinds, historic headwinds in terms of trying to maintain control of the House, um, maybe even maintaining, maintaining control of the Senate, a, a, a Democratic Party base that might be frustrated because criminal justice reform wasn't done or voting rights um, wasn't, wasn't done. But now we're looking at a woman's right to choose, gone. Um, looking at other rights, potentially on the chopping block. This is a galvanizing, galvanizing issue, I think, for Republicans and Democrats, but particularly for Democrats because, or folks who, who are in favor of abortion rights, because, because now they have lost something. And the only way to get it back is to put more Democrats in the House, put more Democrats in the Senate, so that they can codify a, 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 the right to abortion uh, by law. That's the only way that's going to be done now. Michael, do you see this energizing Democrats more than Republicans? Probably, for that very reason. I mean, this is a right, a right withdrawn, okay? It doesn't mean that abortion is illegal all over the country, but it means that it's illegal in some places. Um, and, and I think that, uh, you know, it's likely to, to concern Democrats because they've lost something. I think that that's exactly right. The problem here, of course, though, not to get you know, too much into the politics of it, um, is the outcome of midterm elections is most directly tied to the uh, popularity of the sitting president. That's what you know, Gallup you know, runs their model, is that if you're below 50 as president, you're going to lose more than 30 seats. That's the history. Okay? Right. Does this make... Um, President Biden more popular? I'm not sure that that's true. I mean, he's, he's hardly a culture war fighter on these issues. He gave a speech today that had some of those elements. Um, but I, I, so I think there can be an effect on the Democratic base, but this is still a very tough election for Democrats. Although President Biden is not on the ballot, 
There are individual members of the House, right. folks in the Senate who are running, and they can run and say, if you want to, yeah. you want to get these things back, if you want to fortify the rights that we have, you must elect Democrats because they are the ones who are going to do whatever it takes, if they have the big enough majorities, to codify, uh, codify abortion rights and protect marriage equality and protect the legal right uh, to contraception. And, and we're already seeing candidates around the country bringing this up, saying today we're, we're going to take this to the voters, uh, we're going to talk about this. Uh, it, it, Michael, I want to. We're talking about the court. Let's talk about the other decision that the right. court handed down this week, uh, negating New York's uh, uh, re regulations on who can carry uh, guns uh, out in the open. Um, that came down from the court at the same time Congress has now passed the first uh, any anything close to gun control legislation in decades. Where are we on guns in this country, given given all that? Well, Americans have every right to be confused with the courts coming down strongly in favor of state legislatures when it comes to abortion. And undermining a 100-year-old law in the New York legislature was a perfectly reasonable law, okay? Um, but it relates to the earlier question. I, I, I do think that there is a concern on, on Robert's part of a judicial um, activism on the right, okay? So what, whatever the favored right is, um, the, the right has, has found ways to do this. But I also don't want, don't want to downplay what the Congress did on this yeah. m measure. This was the first of its type in 30 years. Right. Um, and the reality is that it was a demonstration to some extent of the way you know, Congress should work. I mean, you, you um, make compromises and you have incremental reform. That's what... American democracy does, okay? And so, I, you know, I think there's a lot to praise there, and that included some Republicans, even though they're a lot of them not coming back or are not running in the next year, you know? So, but, so, but it was, it was, I think, well done. But you do have, not but, and, Jonathan, you've got the court going in one direction on guns mm -hmm. and the Congress, in this instance, going in another direction. Well, well the, con the, the Congress is reacting to real-time horrors. Uvalde, Buffalo, plus the 200 plus other um, mass shootings that have happened uh, in this country since the beginning of the year. Uh, and so the fact that they were able to do, do something as incremental as it is, it's the first time it's been done, as Michael said, in 30 years. And so this should be celebrated and should also be recognized as an opportunity. If Congress shows the ability to pass something on guns, they can do it again. Mm -hmm. And so, but, but when it comes to the court's decision, it's another thing that, that worries me, um, this idea of a reliance on ordinary self-defense. Ordinary self-defense is very subjective. And when you are a person of color, do you get the presumption of self-defense? We've seen many instances where the answer is no. A lot, a lot still to interpret yeah. on that one. Jonathan Capehart, Michael Gerson, thank you for being with us on this sure. historic evening. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.